But uh, I'm not. I'm not on army. Oh, I am on. Um, we need a note taker, please. Uh, looking down the list, I I see one particular person I would be inclined to call out as a, a known quantity of uh, previously good help, but it's always uh, great to hear some volunteers. Is anybody please willing to be our note taker for this session? Should be pretty straightforward. Oh. I think that's Braun saying yes to me. I'm hoping that's Braun saying yes to me. Right, and Martin is going to be speaking. So thank you very much for your volunteeringness, Braun. All right, and with that out of the way, let's get cranking. Uh, welcome to uh, WPAC at IETF 111. Um, just to note, we are recording this session. Um, please mute your microphone unless you're speaking. And um, it's good to use a headset to maybe get some of the noise canceling things. Um, obviously, you're here. You found the Meet Echo link. Um, for those who are in other lands, there's some links down there. Um, the notes are also the Cody MG down there at the bottom. Feel free to get there and help uh, Braun and others fill those in. All right. So this is the second session of the IETF. So it's a pretty strong possibility you have not seen this um, yet, if this is your first session. So please know well. Um, that if you're participating in the IETF, you're going to abide by the process and policies. Those cover a lot of things. Um, first and foremost is if you're aware of a patent um, or patent applications and you're going to participate, that means speak, write, do anything of that sort, you need to disclose those. Um, we can help you figure out how to do that if you do not know how. Um, um, you also uh, um, acknowledge that you're gonna, your written audio, video, and photographic records um, will be made public. Again, this meeting is being recorded. Um, Note that we also want everybody to kind of keep it professional. That should be go, that should go unsaid, but just in case, we're going to say it again. Um, there's a whole list of BCPs there that you can um, review if you need to. And thanks. All right. So next, it's us again. It's Dave and I. Hi. Our agenda is pretty. Yeah, our agenda is pretty straightforward. We're going to go through most of this. We've already done. Um, They've virtualized or automatic, uh, automized the virtual blue sheet, so we're good to go there. We have a note taker. We do not have a Jabber scribe. Um, I'll Jabber. If any, yeah, if anybody's in Jabber, feel thanks for doing that. We're right, gonna I basically mean, I, we're we're gonna be keeping an eye on Jabber too. So okay, great. So we're gonna, we really got two topics. Um, one is the use case status, and the other one is the bundle. Um, we did get some slides from Felipe. Um, I wasn't sure if I was going to get some from Jeffrey, so I threw him in there. It shouldn't be 10 minutes. It's going to be the rest of the session. Um, so unless anybody has any uh, agenda bashing they'd like to do, we're going to kind of just jump into the use case discussion. We do not have slides. We'll just have a general discussion about it. Any bashing? Uh, I think it's worth mentioning that Sean might have to duck out before the end of the session, depending on how yep. quickly we get through what we do have on the table here. Yep. OK, sold. Um, so in terms of the use case document, we did a working group uh, call for adoption. And we got only a, a couple of responses. Obviously, the author was like, sure, I'll do the work. We got one person, I think, that kind of indirectly said they really think they need it. And we got two people that were like, we don't really think that we need to do this document. So um, we checked with our ID and whether or not we were required to do this and confirmed what I think David and I knew is that it's not really necessary that we actually produce a use case document. But um, Francesco would like to have the use cases at least documented somewhere. So, you know, we've got the document going um, that kind of doesn't need to be adopted. And so it can be um, edited if, if need be, but we can also do. Um, you know, emails to keep track of all these things. So as long as we can point to them and provide input to Francesca that she knows that what we're addressing with our particular protocol, we could be good to go. So I think what I'm going to try to propose is that we drop the use case document from our charter and proceed forward. And I'm curious to hear those who are in violent objection to this. Uh, Rick, please speak. Hi. Um, 
so I wasn't really aware that Webpack was happening, uh, but something caught my eye because uh, I'm one of the co-chairs of the DTN um, working group where, of course, we do lots of work with bundles. So I was I spotted the word bundle and, and followed the links through to, to this agenda. So use case, I've actually just sat down and read it after the last session and before this one to try and work out whether, what on earth you were trying to do. So given it exists, there is some value in keeping it rather than just throwing it out because you all understand what your use cases are. It, 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 there's some relevance to people coming late to the party for this. Yeah, so to be clear, right, that the idea that the document could exist on its own without being in the working group is one thing. Whether we have to adopt it and progress it forward is another because it takes energy, et cetera. Right. I understand it takes energy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, specifically, we do like it as kind of the um, background substrate for why the working group is doing what it's doing, but it doesn't have to become an RFC. There is some benefit for posterity to stop us reinventing this use case in 10 years' time and coming up with yet another technology to solve this problem because we didn't understand why Webpack did what it did. I just playing devil's advocate. Yep. Fair enough. We hear you. Um, so, and there was, see, there was no intention to actually ever publish this document as, um, as, a, you know, as an RFC. We were just going to use it in the working group. And lots of other working groups struggle with this, right? It's like, well, you've got to document this thing to make sure you're doing the full engineering approach. And then you know, it either gets, oh, yeah. published, it gets published before the protocol goes out the door, and then it's wrong, and the protocol needs to correct the document or the use case document gets changed at the very end to make sure it lines up with the protocol. So it's like, eh. so I don't know. I just want to throw it out there. So um, thanks. For uh, okay, so, so one final point, a compromise, which I've, I've done, seen done in a working group before is the use cases are pretty much cut and paste into the top of the, the, the protocol spec. You know, the, the, this is the reason for this protocol existing is included in the protocol spec itself. Okay, thank you, Rick. Thanks. Alexi, please. Hello. Uh, yeah, I just, um, I've heard you were saying that you can possibly work on it without adopting it. This just sounds bizarre. If it's not adopted, then the working group has no control over it. So there is no consensus that it represents anything discussed in the working group. So my suggestion would be adopt it, but just not publish it as an RFC. Then at least you have some snapshot. Uh, okay. Th yeah. Thank. Thank you, Alexi. I, I hear what you're saying there. I, kind of the the um, minimal adoption effort approach. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Martin, please. If we adopt something like this, that means we're going to need to reach consensus on things. And there's a lot in that document that I find objectionable, and some things that I think are quite good and it's a mix and I don't really want to go through the effort of uh, litigating every single one of those points that's a lot of work okay thank you Martin Daniel I don't know if you can hear me uh, uh, you're very quiet uh, I'll be a little bit that's louder uh, I was just gonna I commented in the chat already um, but the, um, the working group, in, the Webpack working group has gone back and forth over a bunch of different use cases in the past. And, um, some of them have been explicitly decided to be, uh, uh, put aside so we could focus on others. Um, and I'm, I regret, I have not followed the latest discussions closely enough to know specifically what's in and out of scope, but even just knowing what is being ruled out of scope is something concretely useful for people who are trying to review this stuff as it goes. So the idea that we're just going to, because reaching consensus about what we're trying to solve is hard, we're just not going to do it, worries me a lot, especially for a project like Webpack that's covered a lot of different potential use cases uh, that may have conflicting requirements. Uh, definitely hear that too. Ted, please. Uh, Ted Hardy speaking. Uh, thanks very much. I just wanted to go back to the point that Martin was making. I have a strong suspicion that if you object to some of the, the elements of this document, if there are protocol features that are motivated by them later and you object to those, 
will then end up in the same place of saying, okay, um, we need this because of X, uh, unless we have a canonical list of X, we'll, we'll end up dealing with it for anything that's at all controversial anyway. And I would rather kind of take Alexi's perspective and say, let's adopt it, agree that the working group decides what goes into it, and then choose to publish it or most likely not choose to publish it later. Um, but in the meantime, that means we can separate the litigation about what use cases rightly should motivate protocol features from discussion of the technology to achieve them. And I, I really kind of think that that's gonna end up being better. It may not be faster. I don't think anything is gonna be faster, honestly, between those two, but I think it's at least cleaner. And that's why I would suggest going that way. Thanks. Thank you, Ted. Jeffrey. I wanted to comment on, on DKG's comment um, that there's there's a bunch of use cases in the use cases document that are kind of part of the long-term vision. Um, and like we should we should discuss them or discuss whether we want to keep the long-term vision. Um, the current focus is on the subset of those use cases that have more consensus. And Felipe is doing a really good job and, and we'll be talking about the attempt to focus the the kind of core draft on the use cases that have more consensus, um, and I think we don't absolutely have to to get around to discussing the more controversial use cases until we get done until we finish with the the more core, less controversial pieces. Um, uh, except, I suppose, in the cases where we're designing flexibility into the format to support the controversial stuff, and people might want to remove that flexibility. Jeffrey and Martin, please. I think Jeffrey kind of nailed it there in that we, we have had some difficult discussions about some of the use cases, but that, that's a subset of them. And there are some things that, that do have general support. The problem with taking on a, a document that covers all of those things is then we, then we sort of force the discussion about the, the difficult ones to the foreground. And thus far, we had managed to avoid that. I would like to concentrate on the the very narrow thing that uh, Philippe is going to be talking about. I think that would be a constructive use of our time. I don't think pursuing this would be a constructive use of our time. Um, so I'm joining the queue here uh, as no hat because this is definitely not a uh, chair uh, opinion, but just a radio participant part opinion in that I personally would like to see a um, being able to clarify exactly why um, we are adopting the protocol we're doing to address the use case that we're addressing. And so I um, basically I'm looking at a hybrid of uh, what's been discussed. Uh, don't freeze it for the way it is, but at least just focus it down towards the use cases that the working group is intending to solve by going forward. That's where I feel as a no hat participant. That's the, uh, so go yeah, ahead, Mike. Please. I made in the chat that if we think we have good consensus on some of the scenarios, I think there's value in having the use case document as a working group document. If we only have consensus on some of the use cases, then let's have a working group document with only those cases. And if we have more that want to continue in an individual draft, do that. So Thank you, I think Mike. What we're, yeah, I think what we're getting to is that, uh, <clears throat> Jeffrey, can we spin the use case document to only include ones that we think essentially are accepted and then be able to move that one forward and put the rest of them in an appendix and say like, you know, too controversial or, you know, you know, just FYI kind of thing. And then we can kind of nail this down and move it forward. Does it sound like there's support for moving the rest to the appendix rather than to a separate document? I, so now with a semi hat on, Sean and I haven't conversed on it. So you're witnessing this in real time right now. I'd say that, um, whatever disposition that's given, whether it be an appendix, a separate document, or just ignored, um, if we could at least get a focus on the ones that are basically agreed upon. Um, the, the, the rest, it's not that it doesn't matter. I mean, it is good to document, but specifically how it gets documented, I don't think we need to solve right now. 
Yeah, specifically, I have a I have a weak preference for putting them in an appendix because I would like to keep the protocol flexible enough to support them. Um, and yeah, I, I personally wouldn't have a problem with seeing it as a, and here are things that we um, just were not able to come to consensus on. Anyone object? Now's your chance to say, we're not gonna do a poll or anything, just jump in the mic line if you wanna say, wait a minute, that doesn't sound so good. Seeing none, Sean, I think we have a path forward. I think we did, and we even did it with five minutes to spare. Fantastic. All right, so I'm going to pass the um, the driving over to you, Dave, in case I have to drop. Because I think okay, I would, lose, I would lose all the slides. Did you download the slides? I did not. <laughs> Luckily, Hang they're two on. they're they're two clicks away. Hopefully, yeah. Um, sorry, guys. This um, I, I should have been better prepared on this. Um, it was kind of a last-minute change from what we had planned on doing. Uh. And just so I can <laughs> double check, there's not a way for just Jeffrey to run his own slides right now? Uh, I think this is actually Felipe. So if he has them loaded, oh, Felipe he, presenting, right. he can actually do that. Right, folks, one more moment. Hello. Um, figuring out how to replace. Yeah. Okay, I've got the. See, this is the this is the new feature WPAC that I had not previously. Um, Otherwise, I can share the screen. Oh, yeah, that is okay. Yeah, that works better. Have your permission set up. Go ahead and try that, and we can just let you run through the slides. Yeah, I thought I I clicked the yes button for granting screen. Oh, that's because Sean is already showing. Okay, sorry. Oh, now sorry. you should have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries. Sorry about this, guys. Yeah, yeah. That was like I said. I Thank should have been better us. prepared to do the presenting. Okay, it says your screen share was. Okay. OK. Can you see that? Yep. yep. Looks good. OK, perfect. OK, hello, everybody. Um, we are Felipe and Dan from Igalia. I've been working on this also in partnership with IO. I have three main points here. The first one is uh, I'm going to talk about some proposed changes to the spec that are currently in the GitHub repo. And then if we have time, we can also talk more specifically about the resource preloading use case and its relationship with uh, some work that is going on on the JavaScript side, so, side of things. So our overall view of the spec changes is to focus on having a base document for the web for web bundles that is as simple as possible, that covers the minimum amount needed to implement the functionality for which there is consensus, which is use cases like resource preloading. The spec already allows for extensions and use cases that require a more complex format in the bundle to include more information can then be addressed in other documents. The first change is to remove the primary URL. 
This is needed for the functionality of browsing into the bundle, for the bundle to be a self-contained web page. Um, in, this needs the primary URL to be provided, so the browser knows which resource to take as the starting point. However, we think that this would be outside the scope of the core specification. A similar idea with the manifest section, which there was a discussion in the in the GitHub issues about this, uh, that it might even be redundant because the primary HTTP response for the primary URL could already include a link to the manifest. And finally, we think it would be also a good idea to remove content negotiation because it would be more efficient to do the content negotiation on the server. So the server decides which information to send. So it sends only the information that the client is going to use rather than sending all the variants to the client and then having the client do the content negotiation on, on its own. And finally, there's a pull request to add a bundle format document, which it's just a summary of the specification. It just provides a short formal description of the format of the bundle without any new information. Uh, but the pull request assumes that the previous pull requests are accepted. So then we can see how they all um, look like how their result looks like. So the main fields would remain the same, the magic number, spec version, section lens, then the sections, and finally the length of the bundle. The section lens have the name and the length of each section. And then what has been updated is the sections themselves where we have an index that maps from a url to a location in the responses without content negotiation we have a critical section that lists the names of sections that the client needs to understand in order to process the bundle uh, which can be used then for extensions to the to the format to add additional sections for specific formats for specific use cases and finally, we have a section with the HTTP responses for each of the bundles representations. And the location responses remains the same, an offset and a length. And the response itself is an HTTP response with the headers and then finally a payload. And finally, after removing these fields, one proposal or one idea or one question uh, that I would like to, to pose is whether it would make sense to work on a secondary document for a more specific use case, or the use case where you can browse into a bundle, where the bundle has this additional information and lets the browser take it as a self-contained um, website. And there are some interesting use cases that maybe not everybody is interested in working on. So I guess my question is whether it would make sense to have, on the one hand, a simple base specification that focuses on the consensus use cases, and then maybe an extension specification for some, general, some use cases that are not as general, but and that require a more complex bundle format and now before continuing i think we can have a discussion about these points would anyone like to jump in Oh, Jeffrey, please. Yes. So these, all of all of these seem like plausible things to to remove or to move out into separate documents. 
um, and I really want the the working group's opinion on on whether to do it rather than kind of just having us uh, debate among the people editing the spec. Um, removing the primary URL section is interesting because in the kind of follow up use case of being able to navigate to these things, sticking it in a known location allows us to redirect there when when something is broken, like when a version number is is unsupported or the critical section lists. Uh, list something the client doesn't support. And so by by taking this out, we still serve the use case of of sub-resource loading, but we weaken one of the other use cases a bit. Um, we should still be able to support it. Um, the manifest section, we probably don't lose anything beyond efficiency, um, and we can add it back in in a sub separate document. Content negotiation is the really interesting one. Um, it's here because I was trying to represent HTTP um, and HTTP has content negotiation, uh, but uh, it adds a bit of complexity, and it's not clear that you would ever use this except in some some narrow cases. Um, if you want to distribute a translated version of Wikipedia, for instance, on an SD card, you might want content negotiation in the format. But for all of the online use cases, it's probably a bad idea to use it. Um, so again, if we remove it, all of the use cases should still work, but we represent HTTP less well. And I'm curious what, what people think about that trade-off. Rick, please. Um, as I understand it, this isn't negotiation so much as multiple representations of the same content, just in different formats. So there's no, uh, request, there's no negotiating with some remote entity about the content format. It's it's uh, the same content is provided in six different formats within the bundle, and the the end user's device or the end user can select which format he wants to see. Am I correct in that, or have I disappeared off into a different use case? That is correct. Okay, so I, I would avoid the word negotiation because it implies a conversation with some other entity. It's um. It's sort of content, multi-content formats available or, available or something. We keep saying use case, just saying. There has been some active uh, Jabber conversation. Oh, there's one of the participants. Welcome to the queue, Martin. I wasn't jumping to the head of it. Yeah, so, no. um, I, I, going going through these one by one, I think the the primary URL thing has always been sort of overwrought. I I can sort of see the, the rationale for it. You have a versioning system, and you have a an elegant fallback in the case that the version changes. But um, it turns out that we already have a relatively elegant. Uh, version negotiations sort of mechanism. It's called content types and or media types. And you find that if you don't support the media type, then you don't support the content. And that I think is sufficient in this case. And building a redundant mechanism is probably not what we're looking for. So um, I would not go there. Um, the manifest section I've no strong opinion on. I, I think having a, a reasonable thing um, there would be uh, pulling it out is reasonable. Uh, content negotiation is clearly complexity. And um, to some extent, adding extra markdown files to some repository is not really in scope for the working group. Uh, it's the content of the document that we should be discussing. And the content of the document should contain the content that's been proposed for this, I haven't reviewed the content, but I, I think in general, if you have a specification, the specification should explain what it's And uh, putting that in a separate document doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And not to put anyone on the spot, but Daniel, since you've been having uh, active involvement in the Jabber conversation, would you like to add some for the microphone record here? I'll take that as a yes. Hello. Uh, yeah. So, um, <laughs> so 
thanks for the you know positive responses, everybody. This is what uh, Felipe and I have been working on for for some months, and I hope that these these changes can really keep us focused on what I think is the most some of the most important use cases, which are accelerated loading of of sub resources uh, on the web. I think there there there's some interesting discussion on Java about what this means for offline and peer to peer use cases. And I think um, there's been a lot of interest expressed about those, but there's there's a lot of different open questions. And I do think that it will it will take a bunch of focused work that makes sense to publish in a different document. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm happy to answer any any questions about the motivation for these also, but Felipe did a great job explaining. Thank you. Rick, please. Uh, talking about the offline and peer-to-peer -peer use cases, um, so the DTN working group is a transport working group specifically looking at store and forward offline and peer-to-peer -peer use cases at a transport layer. Bring, bring it to us at a later date and we can work on it there or with you or whatever. Keep it out of scope at the moment. There are other people who can help do this, but it's part two, not part one. Okay. Uh, and Watson, please. I'd like to point out that if you're going to talk about browsing into a bundle, you're going to have a host of questions about the purpose, especially if you want it to be a long-term format for things like documents. Um, there's going to be questions about like what kinds of images you can use, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's going to be a whole bunch of work if you integrate in or do it. I agree, it's step two. Okay, thank you, Watson. Ted, please. Already speaking, uh, I'm okay with this being step two, but I think it makes me um, even more anxious that to Jeffrey's point earlier about keeping in an appendix the, the, the list of things that maybe aren't our first um, goals, but are, uh, are still motivations for the work is important because there are certain things that you could do once you, you, you head down the, the path without this as a motivator uh, that would close it off for the future. And uh, I would be very sad about closing that off for the future, as long as we're all clear that it's being pulled into a different document. Uh, it'll use the extension format and the different document to describe it, and we'll deal with that complexity. And I, I totally agree with the, the point that was uh, made by Watson, that there is some significant com complexity to deal with there. Um, uh, but I, I really don't want us making the design so simple that it can't reach that point. And so, uh, a little plea for uh, avoiding that fate from from me. Okay. Thank you, Ted. And um, oh, Daniel's back. Uh, I I do want to say that I I really think all the things that we're removing with these uh, with these proposed changes could be added back in in additional sections. Uh, I'm not the, I mean, Jeffrey mentioned if there's a parsing error that you need to recover from, uh, then you could redirect. I'm not, I'm not sure about that, but all the other ones like content negotiation, you could have like a different kind of index and a different section. Some things might be a little bit ugly, but I think they would all be possible because of the, the extensible section architecture. So I don't think we're cutting ourselves off of any of any future paths. And I'm happy to go into details about how that would work if, if people want to discuss it further. Great, thank you. Um, I'll also mention, because I saw something interesting go by in chat, that uh, Alexi had mentioned that I like the idea of some mandatory to support for some use cases extensions in a separate document to exercise the extensibility. I don't know whether that's going to get traction, but that was a, that was a thought that was out there. Um, I think that we've actually wrapped up discussion on this point though, uh, Felipe, if you wanna move forward. And by the way, welcome back, Sean.
Okay, then I will continue with the with the next points. Um, the slides are already in the materials for the talk, so I'm going to go a bit quick, so we have some time to talk about them later. Uh, we have been focusing on the use case of using bundler responses for preloading resources. Uh, we have a um, GitHub repository we ha where we have been working and where we are going to keep working in the in the coming days. And then the Chromium team has an experimental implementation of very similar ideas. Uh, we also elaborated a document listing the small differences uh, between these two proposals. So the background for this is that modern websites can have hundreds or thousands of resources and fetching them one by one has pretty poor performance. So developers have created the bundler tools that combine and transform these resources for deployment. Bundles like Web Webpack create a dependency graph between the different resources and then use different strategies to bundle those resources together, to remove the ones that are not used, to inline some resources inside JavaScript code, or to divide the bundles into different chunks so they can be used in the website in the most efficient manner. And this works well but there's a couple problems first that is not as efficient as it could be because for example retrieving resources from a bundler's output is quite costly and also it doesn't fit well with the catching strategies that browsers use and then the strategies and that bundlers use are not standardized and they are not interoperable between the different bundles. So our goal with this work is to find a solution to be able to distribute web content efficiently, a solution that is standard, interoperable, that keeps the benefits of bundlers from the point of view of developers in the different strategies that they can use and the performance benefits. But at the same time, we also keep the benefits of accessing individual resources that can be catched individually, that can be fetched with more flexibility. So what our proposal looks like, roughly, is that the web document provides a list of resources to preload. The client browser sends a specific HTTP request for those resources that are not in the browser's cache, and the server sends a response with a bundle response with those resources. The components in terms of API are a static API that you can use in HTML to declare the list of resources, an imperative API in JavaScript to do the same, and then the request headers and the server's responses to do the exchange. There are some properties of the web model that we want to focus on preserving, like uh, resource identity and URL consistency. So the same resources can be, be accessed through individual URLs or through a bundled request. And it can be verified that the servers are behaving well in the sense that they are serving the same resources for individual and bundled requests, provided that the headers, the rest of the headers are, are the same. Um, also, in our solution, we enforce that the resources represented inside a bundle have the same origin and have path restriction with the bundle itself for additional uh, security. And for developers, this wouldn't need big changes in the tools that they use and other strategies that they are already using remain possible. For the servers, we want to make sure that there are no additional penalties if this format is no support. The server just serves the resources one by one. By one. And for the browsers, we want to make sure that we fit in the strategies that they use to fetch and to keep resources in the cache. 
from the point of view of the user, we also want to make sure that we do not enable disguising personalized content. Uh, intuitively, bundler bundles should be used for resources that are common to all the users of a website, with individual responses being used to, for specific files that are specific for the current user. We also want to make sure that this is compatible with content blocking, that a trusted intermediary cannot repackage sites, uh, that we do not enable the cheap rotation of URLs in the bundle, and that if a content has been blocked from being fetched through an individual uh, request, it's also blocked from being fetched through a bundle request. So what this looks like in our proposal is that you have a specific format for a script tag in HTML listing the resources to be preloaded. You have a JavaScript API that lets you do exactly the same in an imperative way. And both of these end up causing an HTTP request where the browser adds that bundle preload header listing the specific resources that it is requesting. And the HTTP response must be a bundle response following the spec that we have been talking about, containing the HTTP responses for each of the URLs that, has, that have been requested. Uh, these resources then may be put in the cache and references to them later on might be loaded from there. And because the browser is able to request only a subset of the resources that have been listed by the website, it means that the browser itself is the one that checks whether something has to be fetched from the server or is something that is already in its cache and can be used directly from there. Um, as I said, strategies that web developers use uh, remain possible. For example, loading different batches of resources at different stages when a page is open, page is open to improve the responsiveness. And we also want to prevent the need to download the bundle, the whole bundle, again, when only some resources have changed, which tends to happen with the output of bundlers today. But because with this approach, the developers can have more granularity with how they update a single resource, then we think uh, it will have also better performance in terms of in terms of cache. So basically, that's what we have been working on in defining, proposing an API for doing resource preloading bundle responses with HTML and JavaScript components and then a specific HTTP behavior to preserve user privacy and freedom, improve performance, um, provide backwards compatibility, and without needing any major changes to developer workflow. And my next point talks about how this is being approached at the moment from another angle from the JavaScript side of things. Because when I mentioned that web pages today have hundreds or thousands of resources, one of the major culprits of that is JavaScript, because JavaScript resources and source files have this tendency to blow up in number because of features of the language, but also because simply because developers want to organize the code in different files and want to be able to include libraries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this has some issues in terms of performance. So what my colleague Dan has been working on is in defining a proposal for JavaScript to allow bundling multiple JavaScript modules in a single file. So JavaScript can be natively better organized to improve the performance of the website in a way that is complementary to resource bundle preloading. 
and also in a way that matches other strategies that developers are using today. Uh, this proposal is already being on the track to being standardized at TC39, and you have there a link to the repository. The core idea is that you will be able to declare a module inline inside another JavaScript source file. These modules can then be imported dynamically or statically in other parts of the code. And they could be exported, so they would be accessible from outside, from other source files. And this change would let you reorganize the JavaScript code in a, in a native standard way. Compared with resource preloading, resource preloading works more at the network level on resources of any type, whereas module fragments is a solution specifically for, for JavaScript and limited to JavaScript files. But together, these two approaches, uh, we think, can provide a high-performance standard solution for bundling for the web. So you could use JavaScript module fragments to reduce and reorganize and optimize your JavaScript source files, dividing them in chunks as they need to be loaded, distributing them any way that fits the website. And then with bundle preloading, you could distribute these resources and others in a more efficient way. Um, as I said, Dan is working on the standard tracks for module fragments in TC39. And in the coming weeks, months, we are going to be working on prototyping both module fragments and bundle preloading, and then seeing what next questions come next questions come up of that prototyping. Um, if you want to get in touch, you have our emails there. You have the GitHub repositories, and well, thank you, thank you very much for your attention. I think we got about 13 more minutes left. Um, is there any, <clears throat> excuse me, are there any comments on the previous set of slides or any of the other issues that we people would like to go through? Uh, I, want to, I want to ask what do people think of this uh, bundle subset loading approach that uh, Felipe presented? You were getting feedback all along in Jabber, but um, all of a sudden people become mic shy, so. Which is totally fine, of course. Um, if nobody really wants to bring anything back to the mic and we'll handle everything on the list, that is uh, totally a fine option and you'll get a little bit of time for the end of the session back. And in the side chat, I've asked our AD if she wanted to comment at all, and she also has nothing more to add right now. Um, so this is your chance for last minute comments before we move forward and uh, retreat to online on the list. Okay, Sean, do you have any parting words? Oh, Daniel's back. I was going to try to ask uh, Martin for his feedback, uh, but I guess we didn't um, give adequate time for preparation. Yeah, this was not adequately Sorry. warned for this, unfortunately. Um, <sighs> so I will be looking forward to the list uh, conversation. Uh, Watson, please. Non participant, I am a bit confused by how the semantics of the of the URL structures supposed to work? Are these, is it gonna be like this bundles at a directory and it can it can be a representation of all the resources in that directory? What happened or, you know, is, is it, is it, does that have to be exhaustive over that whole thing if you have a bundle 
and it could have contained those resources. You, you don't look further. It, it's, it, there are some questions here I have. And then with also like cash lifetimes, how do you handle that? Is, is it possible when you introduce this, you start having problems where all these JavaScript files used to be well cached because they weren't really changing, but now they're in a bundle and you're sending the same bytes back and forth every time just because something else in the bundle is changing. These seem like questions that I think I'm not alone in being confused by. Dana? Uh, those, those are two really good questions. Uh, so about the uh, cache lifetime, the idea is that each response in the bundle would have its own uh, header for, for its cache control. And as Felipe said, uh, you know, we we kind of expect bundlers to continue to use the technique of revving, of changing URLs to um, to get the kind of caching behavior that's that's requested. About when one resource in a bundle changes and the others don't, the the semantics we're we're picturing for loading bundles on the web is that. You know, based on this this already widely deployed revving approach, when you request a bundle subset, you would only request the URLs that had not that that had changed the URLs that had not changed, assuming that they had the kind of cache control immutable header or something similar. Uh, would there would be no reason for the browser to to include those in the in the header, saying which um, which files to include, which resources to include. Um, about whether it has to be exhaustive, the answer in our current proposal is no. The um, There's an exhaustive list of the files that you're asking about, and that, I mean, the sorry, resources, sorry, uh, the resources that you're, that you're referring to, and those ones in the, in the client would specifically be uh, kind of, mapped to the, the bundle response. And anything that's not specifically listed wouldn't be specially reserved. But this is kind of a question that we've gone back and forth on in different versions of the design, including different versions that uh, that people in the Chrome team have produced. Thank you. Um... We are once again back to an empty queue, though, prompting further discussion to go back to the list. And so, um, with apologies from the chairs for inadequately preparing um, for this discussion, I think Sean is jumping on to give a oh, I'm gonna say last thanks. minute farewell as well. Yes, thanks to Bron, I believe, for taking notes. Yes, very much thanks to Bron for stepping up for that. Is that it for you, Sean? Um, that and just be ready for the mailing list. I'm gonna, we're gonna, um, I'll ping Jeffrey to make sure we get a new version of the use case document and expect um, a working group adoption call to go out. And I'll ping everyone who spoke during this discussion to provide input. Thanks. Oh, okay. And before we sign off, Justin would like to jump in and say something. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Just uh, hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to raise awareness in this working group of the HTTP message signatures work that's happening in HTTP, uh, just because uh, that I know has some overlap with some of the interest in this group. My apologies, I have not been following what's been going on in WPAC um, closely, although I would like to uh, start working more closely with this community as we bring the uh, message signatures work forward. And thank you. Great, thank you. That cross fertilization, very important. So, um, and I believe we are all done here. You get an extra five minutes into break, and please enjoy the rest of your IETF week. Bye, all. Bye bye.